and them and I am going to try to squeeze environmental racism, neocolonialism, and gender and how it all relates to climate justice in eight minutes. So <laughs> wish me luck. <laughs> um, so first, a few definitions. Environmental racism is environmental injustice that occurs in practice and in policy within a racialized context. Um, and neocolonialism neo is the use of economic, political, cultural, or other pressures to control or influence other countries, especially former dependencies. So some examples of environmental racism in the US, uh, Flint, Michigan is a great example. Um, they have had polluted water since 2014. Um, it is a predominantly black, predominantly, of, uh, predominantly low income city um, and the city has not solved the issue, the state hasn't solved the issue, the federal government hasn't solved the issue. Um, these folks are, they can't bathe in their water, they can't cook with their water, they can't drink with, uh, they can't drink their water, um, anything along those lines. Um, other great examples are Standing Rock and the North Dakota Pipeline. Um, the pipeline was originally supposed to be made through a um, predominantly white, predominantly um, rich neighborhood and then those folks uh, fought against it. They said, you know, it's gonna pollute our water. We don't want this. So instead they made the pipeline through indigenous land. Um, and when those folks fought, they were faced with violence. They were faced with brutality. They were faced with um, demonization in the, uh, in the media, um, all sorts of things. Um, and the pipeline was eventually um, created and their land ha or their water has been polluted because of it now. There have been two uh, spills um, since it was created. Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Maria are also really great examples, um, specifically in the lack of government response to helping folks who were impacted. Um, and it's related to environmental racism because most of the folks who were impacted were of color um, and are also of low income background. The reality of climate change is that a global disaster created almost entirely by rich white people in the global north is going to disproportionately affect the poor of the global south who had almost nothing to do with it. So this is an acknowledgement that uh, the climate crisis was caused by rich white people in countries like US, Canada, United Kingdom, France, et cetera. Um, but it is going to be impacting, um, again, people in the, in the global south who are disproportionately poor and they're disproportionately non-white. Um, so some examples of global environmental racism and its connection to what I just said. Um, for example, country or companies that are based in Western countries like Forever 21 or Apple, they outsource their factories to uh, predominantly non-white countries like India, Bangladesh, and China. And in those countries, there are higher levels of air pollution, water pollution, et cetera. Uh, the environment is just super bad. You know, they, it's not a safe place to live um, because of the outsourcing. Um, exportation of the hazardous waste um, from developed countries to developing countries, um, which are also predominantly non-white countries, um, exacerbates this further. So again, just continuous um, polluting of countries in the global south um, and done by the global north. Um, and then the result is countries in the global south like Haiti, Kenya, Syria, they experience stronger or deadlier hurricanes, droughts, floods, Etc. than in history, um, and because of colonialism and neoliberalism, they don't have the infrastructure <laughs> and resources to protect themselves from these disasters. Um, I think in its connection to colonialism and neocolonialism, um, Holly A. from Where Your Voice Now kind of puts it perfectly. She writes, in the age of widespread pollution, ecological devastation, and climate change, it is we, the colonized, who always pay the price at the intersection of colonialism, corporatic economy, and climate, these systems manifest with real and significant consequences on the lived experiences of colonized peoples. So again, just an acknowledgement that um, whereas people in the global south, um, people who have been colonized do not cause climate crisis, they don't do all the things that lead to climate crisis, um, they're the ones who are going to be impacted the heaviest by it. So I made this little, nice little chart. Um, yeah, so the first step to kind of everything, um, it's kind of like the first major step um, is colonialism and mercantilism slash capitalism. Um, so a state or nation in the global south is colonized and its natural resources like forests, oil, water, etc., are abused, um, often in the name of increasing profit, i.e. capitalism. Um, so for example, Puerto Rico lost 96% of its foresting to colonial industrial agriculture. Um, and then the next big step um, is kind of, is the climate crisis itself and increased vulnerability. So the abuse of natural resources, outsourcing, mass pollution, et cetera, 
leads to a climate crisis. Um, and again, the Global South is where most of the abuse, outsourcing, and pollution occurs. So those uh, states and nations within the Global South are left most vulnerable. And just kind of re, re, uh, uh, I forgot the word I was going to use. But just to like emphasize it further, um, again, the Global South are not, their nations and states within the Global South are not causing all of this. This is happening to them because of richer white people in the Global North. Um, so for example, deforestation is linked to increases in greenhouse gases and landslides, um, and deforestation in former colonies within South Asia has caused an increase in flooding and landslides over the last few years. So South Asia was obviously colonized, and while they were being colonized, uh, a lot of deforestation happened, and now they're um, facing the consequences of that. Um, and their former colonial status means many of these states cannot protect themselves from these disasters which leads us to the last step, um, which is former colonies can't survive. So former colonies today suffer politically and economically because of the destabilizing effects on their countries from colonialism, um, and they can't effectively protect themselves from disaster. So due to lack of economic resources, and increased vulner vulnerability in light of the climate crisis, former colonies are unable to sustain themselves without international help, often leading to displacement. So for example, um, if we look at Puerto Rico again, it gets no real representation in the US and gets less economic aid, uh, meaning it was unable to properly help when Maria hit, um, and it gets cut off a little bit. But um, in June of 2018, uh, 2,300 Puerto Rican families were still looking for housing in the continental US after Maria. Um, so again, just kind of showing, you know, Puerto Rico is a colonial state, it's, it's still in a colonial state, um, and because of that, it was, it was one of the reasons why it wasn't able to protect itself from Hurricane Maria and other similar disasters, or at the very least help its citizens afterwards. Um, and this also, in many ways, just perpetuates colonialism, because if we take Puerto Rico again, you know, the U.S. government can then turn to, Puerto Rico, to the Puerto Rican government and say, you couldn't control, you couldn't um, protect your people, you couldn't defend your people against this disaster, so this is just more reason why we should keep you under our protection and it further delays Puerto Rico's independence. So what does gender have to do with this? Um, well, since 2008, around 24 million people have been displaced by catastrophic weather disasters every year. Um, these people are considered global climate refugees, and women compromise 80% of these refugees. Um, and also, the areas that are being targeted the most are Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. So again, the global south, right? They're the ones who are being impacted the most by all of this. Um, and given women are a marginalized group with less rights, privileges, and power in society, they will obviously be left more vulnerable, especially women of color and or low-income background. So they're the first to be impacted. Um, it's harder for them to leave their areas, uh, their homes when it gets impacted. And if they are able to leave, it's harder for them to resettle for a multitude of reasons. Um, there's also things like, you know, many of them are traveling with children, which makes them more vulnerable. Um, yeah. And then it's also really important to note that um, in countries where women are more politically active, whether that be via voting or actually partaking in the government, um, those countries are more prone to ratify international environmental treaties. So when women are involved with politics, when they're involved with climate activism, um, more, more things get done. Um, it's also super important, probably the most important thing I've said today, uh, is that 80% of the biodiversity left on Earth now is in the hands of indigenous peoples. So basically, the mass majority, the mass, whoa, <laughs> the vast majority <laughs> of our land that is being protected is being protected by indigenous people. Um, and specifically within indigenous people, um, indigenous women hold unique and invaluable traditional ecological knowledge, as well as spiritual and philosophical understandings critical to healing and maintenance of the Earth's climate and cycles. So bottom line, what causes climate crisis? Uh, Neocolonialism, capitalism, neoliberalism, and by extension, racism, sexism, and all other forms of oppression inherently tied to those things. Um, and what does climate justice looks like? look like? It looks like a return of indigenous lands because, again, indigenous people are the ones who are best equipped to protect the land. Um, and we've seen that throughout the literal centuries that they have been protecting their land. Um, and part of that means an end to neoliberalism and all other, or, sorry, neocolonialism and all other forms of colonialism. Um, and then, of course, also an end to neoliberalism and placing people in the environment over profit. Um, and then part of that is also prioritizing women in the fight for climate justice, especially indigenous women.